Good evening, everyone. Uh, new year greetings to one and all. At the outset, I'd like to thank the organizers of ISNAC 2022 for giving me the opportunity to speak on a topic that is very close to my heart. The topic of uh, today's discussion is antibiotic stewardship in neuro IC. Uh, today, I'd be speaking on what is antibiotic stewardship, why do we need it, the various aims of antibiotic stewardship, and how to implement antibiotic stewardship in neuro IC and problems specific to neuro IC and role of biomarkers, specifically procalcitonin and key messages at the end. So let's begin. So what is the literal meaning of the word stewardship? Stewardship is defined as the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. In 1996, John McGowan and Dale Gerding first use the term antimicrobial stewardship. Today, stewardship is applied in the context of governance of the health sector, taking responsibility for the health and well-being of the population. The three main pillars of an integrated approach to health system strengthening are antibiotic stewardship, infection prevention and control, and medicine and patient safety. So as we see, antibiotic stewardship is one of the most important pillar to strengthen our health system. So what is antibiotic stewardship? Antibiotic stewardship or antimicrobial stewardship is a coordinated program that promotes appropriate use of antibiotics that can improve patient outcomes, reduce the microbial resistance, and decrease infections caused by multi-drug resistant organisms. So the three basic important components of antibiotic stewardship are the optimal drug selection, the right dosing, and the correct duration. Because for best clinical outcomes with minimal side effects to the patients and minimal impact on subsequent resistance, if these three are followed well, then our purpose is solved. Now, a lot of us may be asking, why do we need antibiotic stewardship? Let us look at the history. There is a very disturbing trend. Since the discovery of penicillin in 1928, there has been discovery of many new antibiotics, as you see. But over the years, with the discovery of new antibiotics, there's also emergence of new resistant strains. Strains like BCN resistant Strep aureus, MRSA, MDR pseudomonas, Acinetobacter, Metallobitalectomyces, carbapenems, and the list is endless. But if you look at the right hand corner at the top, you see the pipeline is draining. There are very new, new agents that are being discovered and very new antibiotics that are in the pipeline. So this is indeed a very disturbing trend. So if you see worldwide, there has been invasive isolates which are non-susceptible to a lot of the common antibiotics that have been used over the decades, which is very disturbing. If you look at the rate of antibiotic use, utilization, India is very high on antibiotic usage. If you see, there has been a jump of over 62% over a decade from 2001 to 2010 in India. The consumption is 12.9 billion, which is much, much higher to our very, very other populous countries like China or US. This is in fact a very disturbing trend. Optimal antibiotic use is crucial in the critical care setting. Studies have shown that 30% to up to 60% of the antibiotics sometimes prescribed in the ICUs are unnecessary, inappropriate, or suboptimal. So as I said, why are we worried? Because there is there are very few antibiotics which are in the pipeline. According to w Health, uh, the World Health Organization, the antibiotic pipeline data report 2021, only 11 new antibiotics have, have been approved since 2017. Only two of them represent a new class and have a new target of action. Basically, all others are modifications of the existing antibiotics. And the new antibiotics include barbobactam, meropenem, and lefamulin. So antibiotic, antibiotic stewardship is of utmost importance to optimize the use of existing antimicrobials. There has been a slow development of antimicrobials. There is an accelerated emergence and emergence of superbugs and spread of resistant organisms. The only way to limit this is applying antibiotic stewardship. So what are the aims or goals of antibiotic stewardship? 
As I said in the very beginning, the optimal antimicrobial therapy depends on the right diagnosis, the right drug, right doses, and the right duration of therapy. And the fifth and probably the most important and often forgotten component is the de-escalation, that is rapidly decreasing the dose and switching to monotherapy from polytherapy and decreasing the duration of the therapy. So the second aim of the antibiotic stewardship is prevent antimicrobial overuse, misuse, and abuse. So for example, here we have a patient with febrile patient with pancreatitis, another patient who has a small skin abscess that can probably be resolved with incision and drainage. And there is a patient who has been in the ICU for months, uh, probably a patient of stroke who has a positive urine culture. So which antibiotic do we prefer in these cases? Well, the answer is no antibiotics because all conditions do not require antibiotics. Now, the third most important aim of antimicrobial stewardship is minimize the development of resistance because antibiotic use, indiscriminate use has resulted in change in the susceptibility patterns. And it has been seen that the patients exposed to antibiotics are at higher risk of becoming infected by resistant organisms. So it is a vicious cycle where you introduce an antibiotic and there is a resistant infection and then you introduce having antibiotics. So this goes on and on. So then these resistant organisms become transmitted in the hospital or in the community and ultimately leads to significant economic burden. Now let us looking at the team, the stewardship team. So this is probably a difficult component of implementing the antibiotic stewardship team because all hospitals or institutes may not have the requisite team. So it has been said that create a team which is within the budget and the personnel and the official constraints. So ideally, the team should include the neurointensivist in the neuro IC, infectious disease physician if available, pharmacist, microbiologist. In our hospital, we, uh, we used to have the microbiology consultant take rounds with us. And uh, it, it immensely helped us in learning a lot of things that we were unaware of as clinicians. And of course, you need to have the help of the administration and the epidemiologist if available. Now let us see this problem specific to neuro ICU and how can we implement antibiotic stewardship in a neuro ICU. So special challenges. So we have seen that hospital acquired infections are common in intensive care units, including those dedicated to the care of neurological patients. Because patients in neuro ICU have distinct characteristics that predispose them to infections when compared to a general ICU patient. There are higher utilization of external ventricular drains. There are higher rates of dysphagia, which can lead to aspiration and then subsequent infection. There is urinary retention. There are high risk of catheter associated urinary tract infection due to the need for catheter placement and presence of stroke predisposing them to deep venous thrombosis and other infections. And finally, brain injury induced immunosuppression. So all of these makes the neuro ICU population a unique population. So what do we do? So first aim is rapid identification of neuro patients with systemic bacterial infections, because it has been seen that the time to appropriate antibiotic administration is a major outcome determinant for neuro ICU patients with severe bacterial infections. And signs and symptoms of infections due to non-infectious causes has to be ruled out. Obtain specimens for appropriate cultures before antibiotic administration, confirm the diagnosis, identify the pathogens, and once that is done, start de-escalation. So are there role of biological markers specific in neuro IC? We have seen even during the COVID pandemic, there have been a resurgence of the utilization of all of these markers, including C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, and procalcitonin. Let us discuss procalcitonin in a little bit detail. So here is a delicate balance that needs to be maintained in any IC. First is importance of starting an appropriate empiric therapy when the organism is not known. At the same time, keep in mind the effect of the broad spectrum therapy on resistance. Start the immediate treatment of patients with true bacterial infections and avoid overusing antibiotics and selection of resistant strains because mortality increases when initial therapy is inappropriate 
At the same time, the resistance increases when broad spectrum agents are needed. So to balance this uh, treatment strategy, what is the most important component? It has been seen that perhaps procalcitonin here is an important player. So as we said in the very beginning, what is antibiotic stewardship? And where does procalcitonin sit in here? So as you see, see, so limiting inappropriate uses of antibiotics, selecting the right duration of therapy, probably procalcitonin has come very handy. So we have seen the role of procalcitonin, specifically in conditions like sepsis. In here, if you compare procalcitonin with lactate, C-reactive protein and interleukin C, here you can see in, uh, procalcitonin is the first to rise and it has a very high specificity. Specificity is 95%. The positive predictive value is 94% compared to the other commonly used biomarkers. So herein, so the role of procalcitonin stands out compared to the other biomarkers. Now, fever in neuro IC, is it always an infection? So fever is a common occurrence in the neurocritical care unit. The incidence can range anywhere between 23 to 30%, perhaps even more. And more than 50% fevers are associated often with a non-infection cause. So what are the major, most common culprits of these non-infectious source of fever? So most of this is central cause of fever that includes aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, traumatic brain injury, and intracerebral hemorrhage, especially brainstem and pontine hemorrhages. So here, as I said, procalcitonin is an important biomarker for detecting infection. But is there a role of procalcitonin neuro-IC? So it has been said that exercise caution while predicting or uh, guiding your antibiotic therapy based on procalcitonin alone. Because a lot of studies, they have seen the clinical utility of serum prolactin Procalcitonin, sorry, in the neurosurgical intensive care unit, they've they've seen that the utility of procalcitonin is limited only for sepsis and bacterial pneumonia, whereas the selective use of procalcitonin in neuro ICU patients is recommended. Again, the same thing, procalcitonin is a pro poor predictor of non-infectious fever in the neurocritical care setting. So coming to the selection of initial antibiotic therapy. So initial antibiotic therapy could be guided by the uh, the local uh, antibi antibiogram, the prevalence of multi-resistant organisms, including gram-negative organisms and gram-positive organisms. And it has been said that empirical broad-spectrum antibiotics are justified for ICU patients with clinically suspected hospital-acquired infections. However, the regimen should be based on local antimicrobial susceptibility patterns. Second important component is pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic optimized antimicrobial therapy. So a lot of these antibiotics that we commonly use could be divided into concentrated dependent antibiotics like aminoglycosides, which we commonly use, amikacin, then fluoroquinones. And then we have the time-dependent uh, antibiotics, which are beta-lectins and carbapenems. So the most important the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic parameter for aminoglycosides and fluoroquinone is perhaps the peak concentration and the minimum inhibitory concentration. If the local lab is able to provide us with the MIC values, then we can calculate and target an MIC of more than 8 to 10 to achieve optimal antibiotic concentration in the serum. Always remember, if the MIC is not available or you're not able to calculate the AUC, then always develop a priori dosing algorithm based on the MIC, create and clearance, and weight of the patient. Now, coming to the next important component, that is the de-escalation of therapy. So, as I said, serial clinical examinations, microbiological evaluations, and then reassess therapy after every 48 to 72 hours. And each ICU, specifically each neuro ICU, should design its own diagnostic strategy. First, identify the patients who have low probability of infections in patients whose therapy can be discontinued and the non-infectious fever, as we've already discussed. And always, always switch to monotherapy if after three to five days, provided that the clinical course has evolved favorably and the microbiological data did not indicate difficult to treat microorganisms. So de-escalation of antibiotics should be started once we have the culture reports of the blood or the respiratory tract or any other culture report that is available. If there are no resistant organisms like Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter, or MRSA, then switch to narrow spectrum antibiotic. 
if MRS is not found, then vancomycin and linezomib should be stopped unless there is an infection with gram positive bacteria which is susceptible only to them. And very broad spectrum agents like carbapenems, piperous lintazobacter, and cefepime should be restricted to patients whose infectious pathogens are susceptible only to them and should not be continued empirically. Next important component of antibiotic stewardship is shortening the treatment duration. So shortening the duration of antibiotic is very important to reduce the emergence of resistant organisms. We do, how do we do it? We use either clinical features or markers of rectal infections like procalcitonin. As I already said, procalcitonin is a useful marker in neuro IC provided it is for systemic infections like sepsis or respiratory tract infections, ventilator associated pneumonia or a potty or uh, other uh, bloodstream infections. So it has been said that if there is a decrease of procalcitonin value by 80%, then the antibiotics can be stopped. So when we look at antibiotic stewardship or when we practice antibiotic stewardship every day, at the end of the day, we should question ourselves whether the dosing is optimal, whether the combination is useful, whether the toxicity has been assessed, or whether we need to add a new antibiotic or is the escalation feasible and safe and let us start the escalation. Okay. Now, problems specific to neuro ICUs are the use of invasive devices. One most common invasive device that we use is external ventricle drains or EVDs. It has been said that if the EVD placement and maintenance is based on a protocol designed by the neurosurgeon and followed by neuro neurointensivist, then the rates of infection can come down. So it includes the presence of a checklist, strictly maintaining the sterility during the procedure, hair removal, tunneling, use of occlusive pressings, post-procedure prophylactic antibiotics, and reduction in the frequency of CSP. Bye, bye. Unless required, do not frequently sample the CSF uh, from the EVD. And finally, aseptic technique for sampling on the manipulation of the So I've highlighted this point, that is post-procedure prophylactic antibiotics. So how long is the recommended duration of antibiotics after inserting an EVD? So, some studies have said that just a single dose prophylaxis regimen is sufficient, or if you need to continue, you can continue antibiotics for a maximum of 24 to 48 hours after the EVD placement. Because if you continue antibiotic placement, be, uh, continue antibiotics beyond 48 hours, there is an increased chance of infections, especially with resistant organisms or clostridium. So implementation of a comprehensive EVD bundle that emphasizes aseptic technique throughout the entire lifespan of the EVD has the ability to significantly decrease rates of ventriculostomy related procedures. Silver or antibiotic impregnated catheters are included in many EVD bundles in neuro ICUs where the VRI rate approaches zero. And use of silver or antibiotic impregnated catheters may reduce the need for prolonged systemic, systemic antibiotics and this decreases the unnecessary prescription of antibiotics in neuro ICUs. Now, coming to infection prevention for patients with intracranial pressure monitoring. The effect of prolonged prophylactic antibiotics in patients with parenchymal ICD monitoring, there's been a study, okay. several studies, one of which included 279 patients with TBI, and they changed the protocol from the use of a broad spectrum antibiotic that is ceftriaxone to a narrow spectrum antibiotic, cefazomine. And they saw that there was a higher proportion of systemic infections arising from resistant gram negative species in the broad spectrum group. So this clearly signifies that we did not use broad spectrum antibiotics even with a patient with an invasive device like an ICP monitor. Then infection prevention for patients with subdural or subgalic drains. So they, here also several studies have been done, done and they have eliminated the use of prolonged prophylactic antibiotics like cefazoline or vancomycin in post-operative neurosurgical patients with subdural or subgalic drains. And they have seen there's no resistant organism grown in the no antibiotic group, and that has cost a lot of money to the patient and to the hospital. Now, prophylactic antibiotics. Is there a role of prophylactic antibiotics to prevent hospital acquired infection in neuro ICs? The studies that examine whether prophylactic antibiotics are effective in lowering rates of ventilator associated pneumonia in patients presenting with coma, and they found that patients 
uh, in coma due to TBI, stroke, or post neural surgery patients with a low GCF and mechanical ventilation of more than 72 hours, that despite the reduction in incidence of pneumonia, there was no difference in the functional outcome or mortality between groups. Instead, there was emergence of resistant organisms. So as I said, Clostridium difficile infection is again a concern for immunostimulation a prolonged use of antibiotics and it has been seen for neuro ICUs the prevalence is 0 0.4 to 0.5% with an infection rate of 8.3 per 10,000 patients and most common antibiotic that has been associated with CDEF is cephalosporin 71% cases. So risk factors for acquiring CDEF infection include prolonged hospital stay and antibiotic use especially for concurrent infection for prolonged period and immunosuppression. So, like access to clean water and air, we have taken antibiotics for granted for too long. Since the discovery of penicillin in 1928, antibiotics have significantly improved global health. But decades of overuse and misuse of antibiotics have accelerated the emergence of resistant bacteria, and not enough new antibiotics are being developed to fly fight against bacteria. So they should be prescribed only when indicated because they may cause serious side effects and existing antibiotics must be used more responsibly to extend their lifespan. So we see that implementing an antibiotic stewardship program is met with many challenges, some of which include absence of a champion, absence of a leader who do it, then there is lack of time the lack of interest or lack of interdepartment coordination or sometimes minimum supporting facilities like labs or epidemiologists or available pharmacist okay and of course utility of the antibiogram which is often not realized by many clinicians so for a successful implementation of an antibiotic stewardship program there should be a structured program there requires an interdisciplinary team educational interventions, training, innovations, and of course, feedback to healthcare workers, because if it has been a successful program, if you give a positive feedback, it's of course, always a welcome step. So at the end, I would like to give the key messages. Hospital acquired infections are a distinct challenge in the neuro ICU population. Specific characteristics of the neuro ICU population render them more susceptible, as we've already discussed. The rapid in ISO emergence and dissemination of multidrug resistant microorganisms is directly linked to inappropriate antimicrobial use. So, how do we solve it? Of course, antibiotic stewardship, antibiotic stewardship, and antibiotic stewardship is probably the only way we can do it. So, rapidly identify patients with infection, start an empirical regimen, optimize the antibiotic dose and stop therapy in the neuro patients for non-infectious fever, narrow down the treatment once the responsible pathogen is known, switch to monotherapy after day three if possible, and shorten the antibiotic administration as appropriate. Thank you. Antibiotics are to infections as fire extinguishers to fires, quote unquote. Antibiotics are among the most potent of all angiolytics, of course, for press practice, quote unquote. Thank you once again for giving me this opportunity.